If someone says Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be thousand times or million times, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Dara Singh or King Kong, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. There's nothing like Him. This is the four line definition of Almighty God given in the glorious Quran, which we call as the touchstone of theology. So all the gods that you people are worshipping, put them to the test of Surah Ikhlas. If your God passes the test of Surah Ikhlas, and the Hindu scriptures have mentioned, then he's a true God. If he fails, he's not a true God. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Allah says, Qulidullah, Abidur Rahman, Ayyam Atadu, Falal Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman, by whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a correct name, it should be a beautiful name, it should not conjure up a mental picture. And this message that to Allah belongs the beautiful name, besides Surah Isra chapter 17, verse number 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 180. Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 8 and Surah al hashar chapter 59 verse number 24 that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful names. And if you read the glorious Quran, there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most gracious, most merciful, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person can play mischief with the English word God, which you cannot do with the Arabic word Allah. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Qul huwa Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes goddess, meaning a female god. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. He has got no gender. If you add father to God, it becomes godfather. He's my godfather. There is nothing like Allah father or Allah by Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes godmother. There is nothing like Allah mother or Allah amin Islam. If you prefix tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning a fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when the Muslims are speaking to non-Muslims who may not be aware of the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if they use the English word God instead of the Arabic word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the way I'm doing today, I've got no objection. But I would like to remind them that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in the religious scriptures of most of the major religions. It's even mentioned in the Hindu scripture. If you read Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number 11, one of the attributes of Almighty God in Rig Ved, book 2, hymn 1, verse number 11, is Allah. And if you look at the Sanskrit dictionary, the Hindu dictionary, it says Allah is the name of God. He's also mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the word Allah, in Rig Ved, book number 3, hymn number 30, verse number 10, and Rig Ved, book number 9, hymn number 67, verse number 30, is mentioned as Allah. Let's discuss the second pillar of Iman, that is, the angels. There's no concept of angels in Hinduism, but they have a concept of super beings which can do work which a normal human being cannot do. In Islam, the angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from light. They always obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have a free will of their own. And angels have been created for particular purposes, for particular duties. For example, Archangel Gabriel 
has been created to get the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his various messengers. The third pillar of Iman is his books. First, we'll discuss the books in Hinduism. The sacred scriptures, the sacred books of Hinduism can be categorized into two types. One is the Shruti, the other is the Smriti. Shruti means that which is perceived, which is heard, which is understood, which is revealed. And the Shrutis are considered to be the word of Almighty God. They are of divine origin. And they are of two types, the Vedas and the Upanishads. The Veda is derived from the Sanskrit word Vid, which means knowledge. So Veda means knowledge par excellence. And basically, there are four types of Vedas. Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Sam Ved, and Atharva Ved. The exact date when these Vedas came into existence is unknown. Which date exactly is unknown? The scholars differ. According to Swami Dhanan Saraswati, the founder of the Arya Samaj, he says that the Vedas are 1310 million years old. But most of the scholars, including the majority of the Hindu scholars, they say that the Vedas are approximately 4,000 years old. Exactly who was the first person who had the Vedas unknown. In which land it exactly came is not known. Who was the Rishi who wrote it or to whom it was revealed is unknown. In spite of all these things, yet the Hindus believe that the Veda is the word of God and it is the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. The next in authority are the Upanishads. There are more than 200 Upanishads. The Indian culture puts a number of 108. And principal amongst them, some say 10, some say 12. And Radha Krishna has mentioned 18 principal Upanishads. He's compiled them in his book. The other type of sacred books are the Smriti. Smriti means that which is remembered. That memory. And the Smriti are less sacred as compared to the Shruti. And they are not considered to be of divine origin. They are not the word of Almighty God. But they are written by human beings. And mainly they contain the rules and regulation how a human being should lead his life and also called as Dharma Shastra. Among the Smriti, we have the Itihas, the two great epics which all of us know, most of the Indians know. One is Ramayana, we deal with the story of Sri Ram, which most of the Indians know. The other is Mahabharat, which deals with the story of a feud between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, and also deals with the story of Sri Krishna. And most of us, the Indians, they are aware of Mahabharat. The most popular amongst the scripture is the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharat. It contains 18 chapters. It is part of the Bhishma Parv, chapter number 25 to 42, 18 chapters of Mahabharat. It is the guidance given by Sri Krishna to Arjun in the battlefield. The other sacred scriptures are the Puranas. Puranas means ancient. In Hindi we say Purana hai, Purana ancient. So Purana means ancient. It's very popular and Maharishi Vyas has compiled 18 voluminous Puranas. It deals with the stories of gods and deities and deals with the story of the creation of the universe. Principle amongst the Purana is the Bhavishya Purana talking about the future. There are various other Hindu scriptures. We also have the Manusmriti, the law of Manu, and various other scriptures. But the most sacred amongst all the scripture, Hindu scripture, is the Veda. If anything contradicts with the Veda, the Veda has to be followed. It is number one in authority. Let's discuss the books in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, well, he called it Ajlin Kitab. In every age, have we revealed a book? Almighty God has sent several revelations.